he died that we might live and live more abundantly if there is one thing that has come from this trying circumstance we find ourselves in of the COVID-19 virus uh, is that uh, we are blessed and even yet we are blessed in many ways. It brings us to realize how good God has been to us and how good he wants to be to us. And you know, if we never had any big problems, we wouldn't know just how big God is, would we? Now, God is going to bring us through this, and only God could do such a thing. Because without him, we can do nothing. I... <clears throat> I, I still think even in the solemnity of, of, of our circumstances that, that we need to have something to laugh about. We need to have something to joy about. We need to have something to, to remind us that, that we have a lot to be thankful for and we have a lot to be happy about. And uh, because of the, the situation where uh, we're doing a lot of the hand washing, you know, and all of this uh, reminds me of a story I read several years ago. Uh, I've used it in an illustration before, but it really fits now. Frank, uh, there was a school and, he, and the, the first grade took a tour and they went to the hospital. And they took, uh, that was back before the one visitor thing, you know, <laughs> back in the old days. They were going through all of the situation. They were watching the nurses and the doctors and they were over at the sinks of washing and they'd go and do this and they'd come back and they'd wash and they'd go do this, you know. And end of the tour, why, the guide asked if any of the kids had any questions. Well, nobody really raised their hand, and directly one little boy in the back of the class raised his hand, and he said, yes. And he says, well, I got a question. Why do nurses and doctors wash their hands so much? And the tour guide said, well, there's two reasons, young man. He said, the first reason is they love clean, and the second reason is they hate germs. <laughs> now, uh, we find that, uh, that we uh, are uh, concerned about the virus and, uh, hey, something we can't even see uh, can just slow our whole uh, country down to a, a slow pace and uh, makes us wonder what tomorrow holds. Well, I, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. And I know that the best is yet to come. And I'm not just talking about the situation of, of the uh, pandemic. Uh, I want to talk about something much more pleasant. I want to talk about something much more uh, exciting. I want to talk about something that that is, uh, is uh, something we celebrate every year about this time. And it's called Easter, uh, Resurrection Sunday, Resurrection Day. And it commemorates a happening that in the history of, of the human race actually happened. You know, God's Word is not, as Peter says, a fairy tale. No, we worship a God who is real and He is waiting for everyone to turn to Him and have a peace in their heart about everything. Now, having that peace in our heart, that joy in our heart, it doesn't mean that we're not having troubles. It doesn't mean that we're going to be exempt from, uh, from hard times or, or bad situations. But it is an assurance that we do not travel alone, that He is always with us, and He has promised to take us through every trying circumstance. God says, I will not put more upon you than you can stand. Now, Paul put it this way, for me to live is Christ, for, for me to die is gain, because Paul said, I know whom I have trusted, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have entrusted to him, my soul, my life, all that I am, against that day of the coming of the Lord, that day, judgment day, that day when we walk out into eternity. And so God, from the foundation of creation, saw a need that one day he would, he, not us, 
he would have to make a great sacrifice in order that his prized possession of his creation, mankind, could live. Today we celebrate Palm Sunday. Uh, and uh, as a uh, title this morning, which seems maybe to some uh, kind of strange, but the Lord laid on my heart, and I was sharing with Frank uh, the, the, this this passage that that God has has given to me this week that we that we're going to talk about. I, I, I thought, what am I what are what am I going to call it? What am I going to title this sermon? Well, I'm uh, definitely. Not a catchy titler for sermons. In fact, I'm not a catchy preacher either. But here's the thing. I have titled this because God spoke to me last night. All week I've thought about this, and I couldn't come across a, 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 what I was going to call it. But last night, just three words come into my thinking. Valley of Decisions. Now, what does that have to do with Palm Sunday? What does that have to do with the last week that Jesus spent on planet Earth before the crucifixion? What does it have to do with the trials that Jesus went through? What does it have to do with Easter? Because Easter itself brings the need to us to make a decision. We're either going to believe or we're going to reject. We're going to believe or we're going to, to say, oh, there's nothing to that. Now, in this case, history bears the facts. So uh, you, you may not believe God's Word, the Bible. However, I do from cover to cover. Amen. I even believe the front cover because it says, Holy Bible. God is a holy God. Amen. And He is a loving God. Amen. And in the midst of, of busyness, He wants us not to forget that He and He only is worthy of our praise, of our worship, of our time. And I hope that if nothing else, this slackening of pace, this trying circumstance we find ourselves in, this time frame in time will bring us back to the point of putting God first, of praying, of seeking His face, of, of humbling ourselves before Him. That's right, amen. Because he, he is the one who does everything for us. And I can only think that as Jesus on Palm Sunday, and we're going to be reading from Luke's Gospel this morning, so if you're at home and, and you have your Bible, and by the way, while you're looking up Luke 23, let me say to you all out there in uh, the airwaves country, uh, praise God, I, I, I'm glad that you can not hear me, but hear God's Word. But if you do not have a Bible, I would like to encourage you to contact us. We'd like to give you a Bible. We'd like to get you a Bible. Amen. You you need a Bible. You need God's Word. And if there happens to be someone out there that doesn't have one, please call the church here. Call one of the members here. They can get a hold of me. I, uh, my, in fact, my phone number's in the directory. And uh, by the way, I'll just give it to you, 417-458-4236. I don't mind. And you call, and we'll be sure to get you a Bible. You need that. But in the last week of Jesus' life, we see him fulfilling prophecy that had been given by God down through the Old Testament for hundreds and hundreds of years. And all of those prophecies came to be fulfilled in none other than Jesus Christ, the true and living Son of God. Yes, He was the God-man. Yes, He was the Messiah. Yes, He was the Savior. That's what Messiah means. The one who would save His people from their sin. God came 
through His Son, Jesus Christ, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And He sent Him to be a, a, a living proof of how God is and how God loves and how God understands those in, that find themselves in life's race. And so in, in uh, Luke's gospel here, we're going to read about several different people that found themselves in the valley of decision. The decisions we make have dire consequences, some worse than others. Right now, we could, we could be disobeying the, the uh, orders of our, our experts in the medical field. We could just be going about our regular lives. But would we really accomplish what's important? Jesus said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. How can we love one another? I heard, uh, um, uh, oh, what's his name, Taylor on uh, 89.1 this morning was talking about, he said, you know, he said, I, I personally, he said, I, I have no great fear of this um, virus, but he said, I really, you know, he said, one thing that really bothers me is to think that I might be the one who would give it to someone who might succumb to it. And he said, that'd be a terrible load to pay. And so I, I, I think about that, and I think that that is really, to me, the correct way to look at this. What can I do to help and love someone that I don't want to see go out into eternity? Now, we're all going there, and it may be through this virus, or it may be through something else. But however it be, only God knows. And so until that happens to us, we're going to continue and we're going to pray and we're going to believe and we're going to walk with God and trust in Jesus Christ. So Palm Sunday, what Palm Sunday is all about is that um, in the Old Testament, in the book of Zechariah chapter 9, uh, verse 9, in fact, um, God gives his word to Zechariah how that, uh, I'll have to hunt it, I changed Bibles this morning, so um, it is right back, just right after Haggai, I think it is. Uh, since I didn't have it marked, you'll have to, have to wait on me to find it here. Yeah, all right. We got there. Zechariah. Chapter 9, verse 9. What are we talking about? Palm Sunday. What would happen? What would, why would this be a, a, um, a great day? And here is what God has to say to Zechariah in chapter 9. He said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold your king. He comes to you. He is just and he has salvation. He is lowly and riding upon an ass, upon the colt, the foal of an ass. And when we look into Luke's gospel, we look into Mark's uh, uh, letter, uh, we find in chapter 19 of this actually coming to pass. You remember when Jesus sent to... Uh, uh, I believe it was James and John, or Peter and, and John, to, uh, to get the, uh, uh, a donkey. And he said, you'll go into the city and you will find a, a man with a, a donkey that has a cold. Get them and bring them to me. And so when you... When you read about it, Jesus gets on the colt, never been rode, but he comes into Jerusalem, 
and the multitudes that f had been following him they had ha seen him cure various diseases they had seen him raise the dead they had seen him cure the blind they had seen him heal the deaf they had seen him walk on water they had seen him feed thousands with a little boy's lunch they knew that this was the only one that could do such things being that he was the coming king of Israel. He was the Messiah. He was the Savior. Amen. You know, we, we uh, often talk about him being the uh, King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He alone is the one to whom all authority is given. Not to a king of a country, but the king of every country. Everything that is belongs to him. He created it. And it says, by him all things exist. All things consist. So, as we think about this, he comes in and the multitudes uh, cut down um, limbs from the, the trees along the path as they came down the, the uh, Rosa del Rio, I think is what they call the path coming into Jerusalem. And as they strewn the, uh, the pathway to make it smooth, to make it lovely, uh, to make it even for the coming king, the Messiah, they worshiped him. And one thing they said, hallelujah, hallelujah, praise be to God, the Father. As he came into Jerusalem, we see the prophecy fulfilled of Zechariah hundreds of years before. And so as we think about that week, and think about all of the thousands that were around. You see, this was coming close to the feast of the Passover. And isn't it amazing that God does things at specific times? God has a plan. And everything co uh, 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 correlates around how God wants things to be and how he brings them to see that one thing is not isolated from another, that the feast of the Passover that the Jewish nation celebrated from the coming out of, of uh, Egypt hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, centuries before. Moses led them out, but it was after the shedding of the blood of the Passover. Now something that God would accomplish much more than freeing a, a nation of slaves from another nation. And that's a great thing, isn't it? But something much greater would be done later on that the feast of the Passover would be an example of that you and I can celebrate, and that's why we're celebrating Easter. God didn't free us from another nation. God freed us from the penalty of sin. Every person on planet Earth is a sinner. I, I don't say that lightly because I, uh, I'm the head of the group. And none of us, none of us are sinless except the one who died for us. Jesus Christ, he was without sin. And so when we see that, that he had come down on that uh, uh, road into De uh, Jerusalem and they had cried, Hosanna, Hosanna, son of David, because God had promised David that he would always have an heir that would sit on the throne of Israel. Now something that you and I can look forward to today is that this same Jesus that rode the donkey into Jerusalem the week before the crucifixion 2,000 years ago. That same Jesus is coming back. And he is going to rule and he is going to reign on planet Earth. I can assure you that because God's word is faithful, it is true, and it will come to pass. God has spoken it, and so it will be. I can't guarantee much in this world because like everyone else, I can't see past the end of my nose. 
However, that's why God has given to us this wonderful, awesome book that I'm ashamed to say is so unfrequently read in America. How can I say that? How do I know that? Because of the way that we are living in America. The things that we have done that directly contradict God's Word. It's the same road that Israel traveled in history. And we find ourselves going right down the same road. And I hope and pray that this will be a turning around. A turning around of people that say, you know, man, I can tell you right now, I ought to read my Bible more. I ought to pray more. We all ought to pray more. Billy Graham said there's no one, no one anywhere that doesn't need to pray more, that doesn't need to walk closer with God, that doesn't need to pay more attention to what God is saying. Jesus found it necessary every day that he would go and he would pray. The disciples were so enthused and so so influenced by Jesus' prayer life that they asked him to teach them how to pray. Oh, I, and, and we're going to get to walk and talk and, 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 and visit with him again one of these days. We worship Him. We, we hear Him by faith. We hear Him through His Word. We hear Him through prayer. Prayer is our lifeline. Prayer is not to get our will done in heaven. Prayer is to get God's will done in our lives and on planet earth. But it says in the book of Psalms, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. We pride ourselves with the epitaph of being a nation, one nation under God, and so we ought to be, and so we have been. But folks, we cannot be one nation under God when we don't allow God's Word to govern and rule our lives. God says, if, if I'm not Lord of all, I'm not Lord at all. And so when we think about this, we see so many people in this passage this morning that were in the valley of decision. And I think we're in a valley of decision today. And I thought about the songs that we've sang this morning. Good songs with a great message about the cross. That cross is the emblem of the sacrifice that was paid for my sin debt that I might have the opportunity to believe in the one that God sent that he would have the power to save me from eternal loss God would that no man perish but that all would be saved for he gave his only begotten son God so loved us that he gave this now, one week after the multitudes of Jerusalem were, were celebrating and, and viewing Jesus here as the Messiah, as the King of Israel, and, and we find that there were many who were, were not celebrating, definitely, but so many that were celebrating and yet one week later we see a tremendous multitude saying crucify him crucify him you see it's easily it's easy to be deceived if we do not have an anchor 
they had not yet many of the followers had not yet accepted him as Lord. They believed that he was the coming king. But you know what they were interested in? They were interested in being freed from the, the power of Rome to tell them what to do as a country. They were thinking that, that God was going to reestablish Israel and set them up as a kingdom and, and rule on earth. And he's going to. <laughs> But God had something much more important to win. There was another battle that had to be won. And that was a battle for the souls of mankind. It was a spiritual battle. And let me tell you today, there's a spiritual battle going on around us. There is much to do made about the powers that be, the authorities that be. But let me tell you what God says about the powers that be. Let me tell you what God says about the authority that is invested in whatever president, whatever leader, whatever king, czar, or whatever, wherever country. God says, I establish kingdoms. I establish nations. I bring them up. I can take them down. I establish leaders. I set them up. God says, pray for your leaders. Whether you agree with them or not, pray for them. How are they going to rule if God is not God of their decisions? I'm not going to get political, but I tell you, if you want to know where I stand politically, all you got to do is ask me, and I'll tell you. But my friend, there is one who knows what ought to be and how it ought to be. And he wants us so very clearly to know today that he has provided everything that is necessary that we can come to know peace and joy and purpose in life and we can live in a way that God can bless. Oh my. I, everybody wants God to bless America. I do. But you know what? Do we ever stop and think that America, I wish America, I wish the world would bless God. That we would be a blessing to God. And this Easter, we're going to celebrate Easter. I have seen, again, a little, little deal you all probably did. You Facebook users probably seen it on Facebook this week said, listen, we're going to celebrate Easter. They tried to rule it out 2,000 years ago and all hell couldn't stand against it. I'm going to tell you, we're going to celebrate Easter because it's a real thing and I hope and pray it becomes a real thing for those that do not know Him today. But until you know Jesus, Easter doesn't mean a thing. It's just another holiday. It isn't even a holy day. It's just a holiday. But when you know Him... It becomes meaningful. Amen. The week was very busy for Jesus Christ. Between the triumphal entry into Jerusalem until the 23rd chapter of the book of Luke. And there's where we're going to take up. But if you want to read between Luke 19 and Luke 23, you'll find how busy it was and what Jesus had to confront and contend with. We think we have it hard today. My friend, I'll tell you, Jesus fought a battle that none of us are able to fight, let alone win. And he won it efficiently. He won it successfully 100%. Now... I'm going to read the 23rd chapter. It's kind of a long chapter, but we're not going to focus on all of it because I want to show you the, 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 the most successful 
decision that was made on the cross of Calvary 2,000 years ago. And lots of decisions were made. But one was successful. Verse 1, chapter 23, Luke's Gospel says, And the whole multitude of them arose and led him unto Pilate, Jesus. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. And Pilate asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answered Pilate, and he said, You say so. Then said Pilate to the chief priests and the people, I find no fault in this man. Now we'll talk more about that a little bit later. And they were the more fierce, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. And when Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. As soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time getting ready for the Passover. And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things about this Jesus, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. And then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. And the chief priest and the scribes stood and vehemently accused him. Herod with his men of war set him at naught, mocked him, arrayed him in a gorgeous robe, and sent him again to Pilate. And the same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were at enmity with themselves. One thing that, let me say, one thing today that brings people who don't believe in God together is their belief that there is no God how wrong they are. Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests and the rulers of the people, verse 13, verse 14, said unto them, You have brought this man unto me as one that perverts the people, and behold, I have examined him before you. I find no fault in this man touching those things whereof you accuse. No, nor yet Herod, for I sent you to him, and lo, nothing worthy of death is done in him. I will therefore chastise him and release him. For of necessity that he must release one unto them at the feast. They cried out all at once, saying, Away with this man! Release unto us Barabbas! Now, Barabbas was one who for certain sedition made in the city and for murder was cast into prison. He was a criminal. Pilate therefore, willing to release Jesus, spoke again to them, and he cried, and they cried, Crucify him! Crucify him! He said to them the third time, Why, what evil has he done? I have found no cause of death in him. I will therefore chastise him and let him go. And they were instant with loud voice, requiring that he might be crucified, and the voices of them and of the chief priests prevailed. Notice that. Today we would say the squeaky wheel gets the grease, wouldn't you say? Pilate grew sentence that it should be as they required, and he released unto them him that for sedition and murder was cast into prison whom they had desired, but he delivered Jesus to their will. And as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and on him they did lay his cross, that he might bear it after Jesus, or with Jesus. And there followed him a great company of people and women, which also bewailed and lamented him. There were true followers there that day, and it broke their heart to see their Lord and Savior, the one who, who could accomplish great miracles, the one who God had sent, be treated in such a terrible way. But Jesus turned to them and he said, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the breasts that have never bore. 
the paps that have never given suck and when they shall begin to say to the mountains then fall on us and to the hills cover us for if they do these things in a green tree what shall be done in the dry now there were two others malefactors criminals and they were led with him to be put to death now we're getting close to the successful decision made in the valley now when they came to the place which is called Calvary where they crucified him and the malefactors one on the right hand one on the left and then said Jesus father forgive them for they know not what they do they parted his raiment and cast lots and the people stood beholding and the rulers also with them derided him saying he saved others let him save himself if he be the Christ the chosen one of God and the soldiers mocked him and they came to him and they offered him vinegar and they said if thou be the king of the Jews save yourself now Pilate had put a superscription a, a sign that was written on the cross in the middle the cross of Jesus and it said this is the king of the Jews it was written in Greek it was written in Latin it was written in Hebrew so that everybody could read it Pilate said I find no fault in him but I'm going to put this on there because of your terrible anger and wrath toward a man who's done nothing one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him and said if thou be the Christ save thyself and us but the other answering rebuked him and said do you not fear God seeing that you are in the same condemnation and we indeed justly for we receive the due reward of our deeds this man has done nothing amiss and he said to Jesus Lord remember me when you come into your kingdom and Jesus looked over at him and he said verily I say unto you today you will be with me in paradise and it was about the sixth hour and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour and the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice he said father into thy hands I commend my spirit and having said thus he gave up his spirit now when the centurion saw what was done he glorified God saying certainly this was a righteous man let's pray father God we thank you Lord for your word we thank you father for your love today and we thank you father for your grace and your mercy father we thank you for the privilege to call upon your name Lord you're worthy to be praised but Lord we are unworthy father to even call upon you and yet Lord you have loved us and made it possible that through the very name of Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior father we can have fellowship with you we can speak with you and hear you as you speak with us Lord we thank you for this day we thank you father today that we have the availability of technology God that that we don't have to be everyone in this building Lord I wish it would hold all of us I wish we could be but Lord you your word goes out and father you've promised that it would not go out and come back void but it, it would find good ground on which to settle and lord that it would bring forth a harvest father we know that man cannot be saved until they call upon you and lord we just ask god that you would draw them through your holy spirit today through your word and through the um, uh, excitement of this easter season Lord as we celebrate in in a different way and yet father may the celebration of of your redemption Lord may 
the celebration of your victory over death and the grave. Be a celebration, Lord, that everyone would partake of. God, that they would look to you for salvation, that they would believe upon your word, and Lord, take it into their heart that you might change lives. And God, by changing lives, change a country. And in that country, change a world. Lord, only you. But Father, you can do all things, and we thank you. And Lord, I just pray that you will continue to work, lead, guide, and direct us. Open our eyes, open our hearts. Help us to realize, Father, how, how thankful we need to be, God, even in trying times. For Lord, we're not alone. And we just thank you, Father, again for this time. We ask God that you will bless it. May your Holy Spirit have its way in every heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we go back to the beginning, I'm going to touch on a few few spots in here uh, about decisions that were made. And, and, and notice Pilate. Pilate and Herod were two of the governing factors. They, they were the ones that were in charge of, of the area uh, of Jerusalem and Galilee. And uh, they were subject to uh, the Roman uh, uh, authorities in, in Rome. And so it was that at this time time of year there was always a uh, if you look at the uh, uh, commentaries and read about the history there was always a desire in Israel even though they were under the rule of Rome there was always a desire that God would send the Messiah that they would that they would receive the 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 one who could set them free the Savior who would establish the kingdom of Israel because Israel was God's chosen people even the disciples were still Still of that effect. I believe that that is one of the very reasons that Judas in his um, uh, distorted thinking thought that if maybe he would, would uh, betray Jesus uh, that uh, Jesus would just wipe out the Romans and, and establish the kingdom. God has a plan. God will accomplish that. But it will be in God's timing and it will be at God's um, unction and in the meantime God took care of the greatest need of salvation that we have and that is for the souls of men. Pilate found himself face to face with Jesus. Now if we look back into Matthew's gospel, I believe it's uh, uh, chapter 25, 6, 7, right in that area, um, uh, we find that, that Pilate here is kind of troubled. Pilate uh, finds himself uh, in the limelight, in the spotlight. He's under the gun, we would say today. He's got to keep order established and yet he has got to, to come to grips with a feeling in his heart that he doesn't understand. I'm telling you, God doesn't just work in the hearts of his people. God works in the hearts of men. We find in the Old Testament that God spoke to a man named Cyrus. Cyrus didn't know God. Cyrus didn't worship God. God was not Cyrus's God. But God said, he is my instrument. He's going to turn my people loose. And he doesn't even know me. And so he did. What I'm saying is that God is sovereign. God is universal. God is almighty. He is over all. And he's still there today. He realizes what's going on. Now, God is not, God is not tickled. God is not, not uh, laughing uh, about the things that are going on, that people's losing their life and suffering through sickness. But this is not God's fault, folks. This is our fault. This is the fault of sin. The Garden of Eden was perfect till sin entered in. Pilate found himself troubled, Connie, in, a, in another way. For you look and you read in Matthew's Gospel where that Pilate's wife came to him before the trial and said, Honey, don't have anything to do with that righteous man. I have suffered a lot in my dreams last night.
Pilate had the power to free Jesus. He even told him so, and it was true. But you know what Jesus said to him? Pilate, you have no power except what was given to you from the Father. But Pilate condemned himself when he gave Jesus over to the mob because he knew in his heart that Jesus was innocent. And that is one of the prime purposes of authority is to conduct justice. You remember what God says to Micah? Malachi, this is what God requires to love justice. Show mercy and walk humbly with the Lord your God. How proud and prideful we become whenever we think we've done something really, really outstanding. My friend, we cannot even will ourselves to take a breath of a morning and get out of bed without God's grace. So Pilate made a decision. It was a wrong decision. I only hope and pray as we think about it today that before he died he made the right decision. But he turned him over to the religious authorities and they had a decision to make. But what he suffered in their grasp was tremendous. Sister Connie was talking about having a, a copy of the movie uh, the crucifixion and uh, the passion of Christ. Uh, there have been several movies put out. I think the passion of Christ was the most eye-opening movie that I have ever seen about what Christ suffered. It's easy to read in the Bible and go through the part where he was scourged and beaten until you, he was hardly recognizable. Oh, well, how could that be? Let me tell you how that could be. I want to get one sermon before Easter Sunday. Now, I want to talk about the resurrection then, so we're going to talk about the crucifixion here. And if you really want to talk about it, you can go back into Matthew. I think he gives a little better, and, and uh, John, about the things that happened to, to Jesus. But, but here we see that he was scourged, and he was beaten to a pulp. He was mocked. He was made fun of. Not only by the guards and the soldiers of, of the scribes and the Pharisees, but the Roman soldiers of Pilate. And they knew how to inflict pain, folks. They knew how to inflict damage. And they knew just how far to go that a person would not die in the process. Now, some might say, oh, you, you, you're getting too graphic, my friend. I think we don't look at the, at the sacrifice of Christ enough to realize what price he paid for you and I. It was a tremendous price. It was his life. But he didn't just die. He suffered and he bled. And it says here, uh, as, as they, they took him to the place called Golgotha, the place of the skull, the place where crucifixions took place, just outside the city. And oh, that's a wonderful sermon in itself, because when you go back into the Old Testament, you see where the sacrifices were accomplished and the blood was brought to the temple. But he says, as they led him away, he was so weak, 
so maimed that the soldiers enlisted a guy by the name of Simon. He was a Cyrenian. Verse 26, chapter 23. And Simon carried, helped Jesus carry his cross. That was one of the, that was one of the consequences uh, for a criminal that they would have to carry their cross that they were going to be nailed to. And Jesus was so beaten, so lacerated, so weakened by this night-long torture that he fell beneath the load. So they enlisted Simon to carry on. You can see the outlook of the Son of God. And I want you to remember something that Jesus said to Thomas. He said, Thomas, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In this, let us see the mind of Christ, but let us see the mind of the Father. For Jesus fulfilled it in every aspect and he brought forth and brought them there and as they laid him down on this cruel cross. Can you imagine those soldiers holding him there? They didn't have to hold him there. Most generally they had to hold the criminal there. But no man took Jesus' life. He laid it down. Now I can imagine him laying there on that cross. That old spike being driven into his hand and him say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They don't understand. You see, we don't understand about a lot of things in life. God understands that. And He loves us anyway. As they nailed Him to the cross, I believe it was more than just once, but there, there is seven, actually there, it's called the seven sayings from the cross. Luke does not go into all seven. If you wanted to get all seven of them, you'd have to read all four of the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Different ones bring out different things that Jesus said. But they're all important. But today, Luke brings out the three most important. Was it the first that God loves us? Jesus loved us enough to lay down his life for us. All of the things in chapter, in chapter 23, verses 35 through were fulfillment of prophecies that were given throughout the Old Testament. How that the soldiers would, would uh, gamble for his, his garments. How that they would offer him a drink and he would refuse it. And in the refusing of that drink, he yet cried out, I thirst, in John's Gospel. I thirst. But he was willing to suffer the pain. Because you see, the, the drink that they offered him here in Luke's Gospel at the beginning of this crucifixion experience was mixed with a drug that often would help the prisoners to endure the tremendous pain. Jesus took it all. And he did it for you and I. But there is a song that talks about the cross in the middle made a difference. And I was thinking about the song as we sung a while ago. The old rugged cross on that hill far away. You see, on that cross, the prophecy was that he would be 
crucified among the malefactors, among the criminals, and there was one on each side. In Matthew's Gospel, it talks about at first they both railed at him. But we find that one continued to find fault, yet the other began to look at the circumstances and realize that this man really had done nothing. This man didn't deserve to be here. And he had to make a decision because this was the day of his death, Lonnie. He knew tomorrow would never come for him. I hear many times about a deathbed conversion. I've even been part of a deathbed conversion. And my friend, I, I would hope and pray that you not wait until your deathbed because you don't know exactly what circumstance you'll be in. But I'm telling you that this is a good example that as long as you have breath, there's hope. If you will just humble yourself before God and say, Remember me, Lord, I am a sinner. He said, Verily, today you will be with me in paradise. What is important about that? Jesus was taken to a tomb. Uh, this, this criminal was taken and buried in a tomb. Were they going to paradise? What does Paul have to say? God spoke to Paul, and Paul says, When we leave this life to be absent in the flesh is to be present with the Lord. I can remember some trips I took, Loretta, when I was younger lot younger and uh, it'd be a long trip my sister lived in Indiana we would go visit and it's oh several hours drive Rushville Indiana in fact was where we was going went through the circle city Indianapolis but in riding my brother was driving and man it was fine because we'd stop just outside of St. Louis at Fisher's High Boy and get a big hamburger and then man I'd go to sleep and I'd I'd go to sleep we was in Missouri and man I'd wake up and we'd be in Indiana man, we'd be in Illinois we'd be somewhere else Ernie I mean we the miles had transpired and while I was asleep we had gone to other locations and I went to sleep in one place I, I woke up in another and I think how easy that is and how much like when we fade out into death we don't know but for us to shut our eyes in death and to wake up in heaven and see the face of Jesus oh hallelujah what a sight what a sight to see. Again, folks out there, you say, well, everybody's going to heaven. No, they're not. And this is a very good example because there was a thief on the left and a thief on the right, and one went to heaven and the other rejected the Savior. Dr. Schofield, in his study Bible, he says, The salvation of the thief on the left and the rejection of the thief on the right is so that no one will lose hope, but no one takes for granted the opportunity they have to accept. It's not a given, folks that everybody's going, everybody wants to go to heaven. But my friend, in John chapter 14, Jesus said, no man comes to the Father, but through me. Jesus, Jesus. So from the sixth hour 
there was a darkness until the ninth hour from 12 o'clock noon to 3 o'clock in the afternoon on a shiny sunny day let me tell you there was darkness for the sacrifice that was given and it was something that cannot be attributed to a volcano it is a situation that can't be attributed to a, a, a solar eclipse they don't last three hours folks but let me tell you what Jesus suffered God gave a sign that if you reject Jesus Christ the darkness will come how dark it is Jesus talked about hell many times and he said they shall be cast into outer darkness and always he put this exclamation to it there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth weeping and gnashing of teeth my friend don't walk out into eternity without Jesus Christ as your Lord the last thing that Jesus uttered from the cross of Calvary he said in a loud voice and he was weak he was weak but he said in a loud voice so that you and I and those around him could hear, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. He gave up his spirit. He suffered and accepted death, even the death of the cross. Now, friend, out there today I hope and pray that you will believe what we have read here because it is truth and I find that one of the things that Pilate was struggling with and I believe it's Matthew's gospel but one of the gospels Pilate says to him truth truth what is truth let me tell you what truth is and there is only one truth and it will always be truth and the truth of the matter is that God loves you and God wants you to know him in a free pardon of sin God wants you to live throughout eternity in a place called heaven and I hope you'll accept that today because this is the invitation now we're here in Abounding Hope Church this morning Two, four, six, eight, nine of us. Hey, we're within the authority. But I know that you out there can't walk the aisle here to the altar. But you can get on your knees in your living room, in your kitchen, in your car. Bow your head and ask Jesus to become your Lord and Savior. Commit your heart and life to him and he will not cast you away. He will answer prayer and he will give you peace in your heart. And I hope you'll do that. God bless you today is my prayer.